Hello, I'm Jason Lynch, and I'm going to be discussing some of the topics, results, and techniques in reversible algorithms. So one major topic is programming languages and software. It turns out that there are fully formed reversible languages, such as Janus, uh, that you can run on your computer and implement and test out reversible algorithms in. I assume that Professor Gluck is going to discuss this in detail, though, so I'm not going to spend more time on that topic here. There's also a notion of theoretical algorithms and complexity theory, often concerned with various models of computation and what can and can't be done reversibly. Uh, so these have given us universal transforms for any sort of program or Turing machine into another one. Uh, these are usually dealing with Turing machine or circuit models, uh, but we'll be looking at some of these algorithms because the ideas behind them are actually quite useful. Uh, there are also certain models of computation, such as Peplin games, and relativized computation where irreversible and reversible algorithms actually differ in their power. But it's a major open question whether that applies more generally and particularly to the types of computation we care about. There's also a lot of really lovely work on things like the algebraic structure, the reversible computation, and a full post-lattice byte classification of reversible circuits. However, for practical near-term reversible computing, something that's going to be really important is actually getting efficient reversible algorithms. And so even though we know how to do everything in general and in theory, we want to find algorithms that have small constant factor overheads in time and space complexity. And it turns out that for a lot of basic algorithms, we know how to do that. And there's a lot more that need research. So starting to look at some of the universal results. Uh, back in the 60s, Le Serre discovered how to do reversible computation generally. And this was rediscovered a decade later, decade later by Charles Bennett. And the basic idea here is whatever fundamental function you want, you can make it by objective by just storing the inputs. So instead of going from inputs to outputs, I go from my inputs to my output and a copy of both inputs. Uh, this allows everything to be reversible, but it has a huge space overhead. Our space overhead is now proportional to the time that our program runs. A while later, Bennett discovered the trick of recursive recomputing. So now we're going to take this history recording method, but imagine if we computed only the first half of the program. We stored a checkpoint at that middle, and now we uncomputed that first half, freeing up all that space, leaving us only storing our original input and our checkpoint. From this checkpoint, we can continue, proceed computing forward until we get to the end, We've found our output of our program. We can uncompute back that checkpoint, but now we're kind of stuck with this extra bit of information that we, piece of information in the middle that we need to get rid of. We compute forward from the input again until we arrive back at this checkpoint and then uncompute everything, completing it. Now, if we use that notion, but instead of just one checkpoint, we recursively put a checkpoint in between all of them then we can get a universal algorithm that has a logarithmic increase in the amount of time spent and also a logarithmic increase in the space spent. And for a while, it was conjectured that this quadra potentially quadratic blowup in space was the best one can do. And in fact, in the Pebble model, it is the best one can do. But 20 years later, a uh, very nice algorithm, but very time intensive algorithm was discovered that actually uses uh, asymptotically optimal amount of space. So here the notion is when we're computing, uh, there's a whole bunch of different branches our irreversible computation might have been able to take. And we don't exactly know which ones it went through. However, we can think of the entire space of programs um, of executions that program could have run through. And we're somewhere at the end of one, we've reached an output from some input, 
And now we're going to want to walk through that entire space of computation until we get to something that matches with the input that we had initially stored. And in this way, we can use the same amount of space that we had initially, uh, but it required exponential time to do so. Almost immediately thereafter, people suggested putting this configuration space enumeration at the bottom of Bennett's recursive recomputing, and doing so gives you a nice smooth trade-off between this exponential time and this potentially quadratic space. And more recently, uh, unfortunately only dealing with circuit models of computation, uh, there's a notion of computing with dirty and silly bits. Uh, so the important takeaway here is sometimes we can potentially use space that has other data stored in it, so long as we use it in a careful way and restore it to the state it was. And being able to use uh, space, even if it has some information in it that we don't know what it is, a priori, um, allow the result that reversible computation can be done with a single extra bit of space, but still this exponential increase in time. So there's also some interesting theoretical results that give us notions of uh, how we might relax some of the constraints on our reversible algorithms. Ali and Vitania looked at trade-offs between space usage and bit erasure as a resource. So they said, uh, we can sometimes erase bits during our reversible computation. Um, does that allow us to save space or time when trying to perform computation? And they showed that you, in fact, have a nice trade-off between the two. Uh, later on, Domain et al. used this, to, used this sort of notion to define word and trans-dichotomous RAM models uh, with notion that how much injectivity you have uh, should be a measure of your energy cost. Along other lines, um, Mike Frank recently formally defined conditional reversibility, which is the notion that even if my circuit element or basic function might not be fully reversible or fully bijective, uh, I might have a computation where I'm guaranteed to only use a certain part of the input for that function. And if it's the case that this restricted domain is bijective, uh, then that should be something that we consider to be reversible. And so this, this notion of making sure that I know what my input space is, I'm using that as a trick to get reversibility is something that we could potentially use in the future. And an analysis of how much reversibility shows up in some of these programs was done by Benedictus, Frank, and Anderson. All right, so what is efficient? We talked about these universal algorithms and said they weren't efficient. Well, ideally, we're going to want the running time and space usage of our algorithm to be asymptotically equivalent to the algorithm that we would want to simulate, or the best known algorithm for the reversible algorithm for a problem. And ideally, we also want small constant factors in overhead. We don't want something to take a million times as long. We want our constant factors to be like twice as long, four times as long. And Axelson and Yokoyama actually uh, had a very nice definition for the following, uh, which is they said there's a faithful simulation of an algorithm, has the same running time, and some space usage that's asymptotically the same plus some function g of n, your extra garbage bits. And they defined a hygienic simulation, which is going to be a very strong notion of efficient, to be a faithful simulation in which this g of n, your extra bits at the end, are the minimum possible of all of these functions. In some cases, like sorting, we actually have a good idea of how many extra bits of information we will end up needing to have along with our output to be able to differentiate between our inputs. All right, so what can we do efficiently? Well, for one, sorting. Uh, there's been quite a bit of work on sorting, analyzing both n squared and n log n algorithms, uh, showing that we can do these reversibly with only constant factor overheads. 
Um, and even there's some algorithms which preserve best case running time and have incredibly small overhead in those best cases. So when you give it something sorted or near sorted, it actually does perform very well. For graph algorithms, uh, most of the fundamental shortest path and all pair shortest path algorithms have been analyzed. So things like breadth for search, Dijkstra, uh, Ford Fulkerson, things like that, we can also do reversibly with only constant factor overheads. And similarly with Prim's algorithm and Kruskal's algorithm for minimum spanning trees, also things we can do. Most fundamental data structures, uh, we also have basic versions of. Adjacency lists, binary search trees, dynamic arrays, uh, disjoint sets, heaps. Now, some of the fancier things um, haven't been studied yet. I would be quite interested to see um, reversible Fibonacci heaps and reversible Van and DeVos trees. But for some of the basic things that you would see in an introductory algorithms course, uh, we already know how to do. And this is a great starting point for looking at more complex algorithms. Um, there's also fast Fourier transforms, matrix multiply, and some other linear algebra that's been done. So uh, what are some of the techniques that are needed to get around the restrictions for reversible algorithms? So input logging, uh, this general notion that I can always save whatever my input was uh, to use it later to uncompute. Reversible subroutines, if I can if my subroutine, uh, the input can be calculated from the output, so it itself is reversible, I can call that subroutine, copy out my output, uncall the routine, saving all of the space it would use. Control flow becomes a lot more complicated. Uh, we need things like paired branching, and in some cases, uh, the conditionals for branching can add overhead. In some cases, when you have things like projected conditionals where they're not altered, uh, they're essentially free. Pointer swapping is a really important one for data structures. Um, so all of the reversible data structures you end up seeing maintain back pointers, not just forward pointers. And instead of destroying pointers, they end up uh, finding clever ways of changing where it's stored so that we never end up having to erase this information, uh, but we also don't end up with an excess buildup. And there's also um, more specified complex techniques like permutation representations, which end up getting used by Yokoyama in some of the sorting algorithms. And so notion here is a permutation on your data is something that's fundamentally bijective. So if you can store what your algorithm is doing incrementally as a permutation on your input, uh, then that transformation itself is going to be reversible. So, what is a good use case for near-term reversible computing? I would argue we shouldn't jump directly to general purpose reversible computing. It's a little too difficult. But right now we're in the age of post morse law where interest in accelerators and heterogeneous architectures is becoming significant. So think of things like GPUs, TPUs, ASICs. Um, so here we have hardware that's specifically designed to be very uh, performant on certain classes of algorithms, whether they be linear algebra, mining Bitcoin, something else. And so looking at this restricted computing class means that it might be significantly easier to design both algorithms and architectures for this. And this is also a case where people are willing to spend extra money to have this hardware that is either incredibly fast or incredibly low energy. Uh, similarly, there's a lot of embedded or ubiquitous computing. So what you're doing on a satellite or with your deep sea monitors or something else in an extreme environment uh, is going to only care about certain specific calculations and computation that it's been doing. And this is a case where we also often require extreme energy efficiency. High performance computing, although this is often thought of as being a very general, type of computing, usually we're implementing massively parallelizable algorithms because we're running it across many cores. So again, we're dealing with a restricted class. And this is another case where people are willing to invest in hardware to get performance. Finally, quantum computing, uh, something that I feel a lot of us reversible computing people have a love-hate relationship with. 
Well, it turns out that quantum computing is going to need a significant amount of classical computation to be able to control their quantum computers. And if they're able to have that classical computation be in an adiabatic environment, so that it itself is very near to the quantum hardware, uh, very cold and noiseless, rather than having to interface with a computer that's outside, uh, this might provide a lot of advantages for that control of their quantum computer. And we can piggyback on a lot of their work on the hardware side, um, if they're making superconducting circuits uh, or other adiabatic hardware. So this actually seems like a great pairing for investigating the types of algorithms that they need to control these quantum computers. So here we see all of these are cases where we have special classes of algorithms, which will make our job easier. They require either very high performance or very low energy, and there's already a willingness to put a higher investment in costs of hardware. And so I think these sorts of areas are actually really the stepping stones that we're going to want to get reversible computing uh, into the mix. And so for those, some suggested targets are optimization algorithms, both first and second order, machine learning, especially deep learning and neural nets are of interest right now and look like they may be well suited to certain sorts of reversible algorithms, uh, differential equation solvers for physics simulation, um, similar computational geometry for a lot of physics simulation, surface reconstruction, things like that. Uh, quantum computers specifically need perfect matchings and certain sorts of inference algorithms to run topological quantum algorithms. Another area is at a distance and other string comparison algorithms, um, specifically for bioinformatics and a lot of text processing. So these are all very interesting algorithmic questions, all ones that are open from a versatile standpoint, and ones that I think getting very efficient reversible algorithms could help lead us down the steps to uh, algorithm and hardware co-design and potentially accelerators or high performance computers in these areas. So I hope that gives you some sense of both some of the challenges and opportunities in reversible algorithms, why they're important, why they're very interesting to work in right now, and some ideas of things that I think we should tackle in the near future. Okay, if you're interested, here's a uh, brief bibliography of some of the things mentioned in the talk, and you should be able to look at the slides offline also. I look forward to seeing you all at the workshop.